Welcome to the Interim Whisperer. The show is all about the future of work and innovation. So today's Interim Whisperer tip of the week, remember to give thanks and gratitude for everyone that you work with and tell them one thing about them that you are thankful for. Okay, so today we are celebrating Thanksgiving, an American holiday that I am not sure many people really reflect on what the real meaning of Thanksgiving is and and what it really represents. So we're going to get started here. And just so you know, this is kind of like a story time. So be sure to snuggle in, get something cozy to wrap around yourself and something to sip on. So most stories about Thanksgiving history start with the harvest and the celebration of the pilgrims and the Native Americans that all took place in the autumn of 1621. And although they did have a three-day feast in celebration of a good harvest, the local natives did not participate. The first Thanksgiving was not a holiday, but simply a gathering. There is little evidence that this feast of thanks led directly to our modern Thanksgiving Day holiday that we now enjoy. Thanksgiving can, however, be traced back to 1863 when President Lincoln became the first president to proclaim Thanksgiving Day. The holiday has been a fixture ever since that time. However, most school children are taught that the first Most school children are taught that the first Thanksgiving was held in 1621 with the Pilgrims and the Indians. The Pilgrims who sailed to this country aboard the Mayflower were originally members of the English Separatist Church, a Puritan sect. They had earlier fled their homes in England and sailed to Holland to escape religious persecution. There, they enjoyed more religious tolerance but they eventually became disenchanted with the Dutch way of life, thinking it ungodly. So they left and they renegotiated with a London stock company to finance a pilgrimage to America. Most of those making the trip aboard the Mayflower were non separatists but were hired to protect the company's interests. Only about one third of the original colonists were separatists. The Pilgrims set ground at Plymouth Rock on December 11, 1620. Their first winter was devastating. At the beginning of the following fall, they had lost about 46 of the original 102 who sailed on the Mayflower. But the harvest of 1621 was bountiful, and the remaining colonists decided to celebrate with a feast including 91 natives who had helped the pilgrims survive their first year. It is believed that the pilgrims would not have made it through the year without the help of the natives. The feast was more of a traditional English harvest festival than a true Thanksgiving observance, and it lasted for three days. Governor William Bradford sent four men fowling after wild ducks and geese, It is not certain that wild turkey was part of their feast. However, it is certain that they had venison. The term turkey was used by the pilgrims to mean any sort of wild fowl. Another modern staple at almost every Thanksgiving table is pumpkin pie, but it's not likely that that was the treat that they had at that first Thanksgiving. The supply of flour had diminished a long time ago, so there was no bread or pastries of any kind. However, they did eat boiled pumpkin and they produced a type of fried bread from their corn crop. There was also no milk, cider, potatoes, or butter. There was no domestic cattle for dairy products and the newly discovered potato was still considered by many Europeans be poisonous, but the feast did include fish, berries, watercress, lobster, dried fruit, clams, venison, and plums. I don't know about you, but it sounds mighty tasty. They're throwing lobster in there at the first Thanksgiving or the second one. Sounds pretty good to me. This Thanksgiving feast was not repeated the following year. Many years passed before the event was repeated. It wasn't until June of 1676 
that another day of thanksgiving was proclaimed. On June 20 of that year, the Governing Council of Charleston, Massachusetts, held a meeting to determine how best to express thanks for the good fortune that they had seen their community securely establish. By unanimous vote, they instructed Edward Rawson, the clerk, to proclaim June 29 as a day of Thanksgiving. It is notable that this Thanksgiving celebration probably did not include Native Americans as the celebration was meant partly to be in recognition of the colonists' recent victory over the heathen natives. By then, it had become apparent to the settlers that the natives were a hindrance to their quest. So the goodwill they shared at the first feast had long been lost. A hundred years later, in October of 1777, all 13 colonies joined in a Thanksgiving celebration. It also, it also commemorated the patriotic victory over the British at Saratoga, but it was a one-time affair. George Washington proclaimed a National Day of Thanksgiving in 1789. Although some were opposed to it, there was discord among the colonies Many feeling the hardships of a few pilgrims did not warrant a national holiday. And later, President Thomas Jefferson opposed the idea of having a day of Thanksgiving. It was Sarah Josephia Hale, a magazine editor whose efforts eventually led to what we recognize as Thanksgiving. Hale wrote many editorials championing her cause in her Boston Ladies Magazine, and later in Gotti's Lady, in Gotti's Ladies Book. Finally, after a 40-year campaign of writing editorials and letters, finally, after a 40-year campaign of writing editorials and letters to governors and presidents, Hale's obsession became a reality when in 1863, President Lincoln proclaimed the last Thursday in the last Thursday in November as a national day of Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving was proclaimed by every president since Lincoln. The day was changed a couple of times, most recently by Franklin Roosevelt, who set it up one week to the next to last Thursday in order to create a longer Christmas shopping season. Even then, commercialism and thinking about the economy. I guess that's a good thing. Public uproar against this decision caused the president to move Thanksgiving back to its original date two years later. And in 1941, Thanksgiving was finally sanctioned by Congress as a legal holiday as the fourth Thursday in November. And we used a source for this, it's willstar.com. So now we're fast forwarding, we're looking at COVID and how has COVID impacted our Thanksgiving? Let's listen to some people on the street share their thoughts about Thanksgiving here. Um, it's a time that people can get together with loved ones um, and really um, show feeling and kind of uh, cherish time with others. Uh, Thanksgiving to me means um, enjoying time with family, uh, being gracious, gratitude for everything that you have been given, um, and appreciation of life. Thanksgiving to me is just spending time with family um, and reconnecting with people you care about and just coming together as one. So COVID-19 put a damper on Thanksgiving 2020, and even though the pandemic seems to have loosened its grip, the hangover effect is still impacting Thanksgiving. At play this year is a perfect storm of problems ranging from supply chain issues and labor shortages to bad weather and inflation. Rather than an actual shortage of food, the snarled tangle in the supply chain that gets food from field to table has made some supplies erratic and nearly all prices higher. 
For those on Social Security, Andrew Sykes, an assistant manager at the United Market Street store in Wichita Falls, noticed an overall increase in food prices. He said Thanksgiving shopping started November 1. That's typically when it comes to people living on Social Security. They come in at the first of the month and they go ahead and buy their Thanksgiving items and budget the rest. Let's go and listen to some more people sharing their thoughts about how COVID has impacted the holiday here. I would say for last year, we didn't have it. But for this year, we're gonna come, we're gonna come back and I would say stronger because since COVID, COVID made so many of us separate, it divided us. But I feel like this year, because of COVID, we're gonna come back stronger together, form stronger bonds. For us, it was more of like, we were limited in what we were able to do because usually we try to, on Thanksgiving, spend our time with helping other people and then spending time with family. It was very limited this year, so I think uh, last year. So this year, kind of like hoping that we can get back into it, maybe go a little bit better, a little bit stronger. And now let's look at some facts that you may not have heard about Thanksgiving before. So just sit down and kind of think about, all oh, right, is this true or not true? Americans prepare 46 million turkeys for Thanksgiving each year. 46 million turkeys. That is an amazing amount of animals that we are consuming. And we need to be thinking about the impact that that has, of course, on our environment especially with global warming and everything that we're going through right now. Thanksgiving without turkey would be like Christmas without a tree. And most Americans wouldn't dream of foregoing this, this crazy bird that we absolutely love to eat. And I am one of those people. But while it's not very popular for the rest of the year, we'll eat it in turkey subs and things like that. Turkey is a huge hit for the holidays and probably because it can serve a lot of people. So on Christmas, an additional 22 million families host an encore with Thanksgiving turkeys being the same center of the table dining. So second fun fact, not everyone eats turkey on Thanksgiving. So if your family goes in a different direction on that day, you're not alone. According to the National Turkey Federation, 88% of Americans chow down on Thanksgiving turkey. However, the rest may be vegetarian or vegan, or they're just taking a stand against a protein that's, you know, doesn't show up on for the rest of the year. And not everybody is somebody that enjoys our American tradition of eating the normal turkey. They may go out for Chinese or pizza. Only male turkeys actually gobble. That's an interesting fact too. So if you learned in preschool that a turkey goes gobble, 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 that's only about half true. Only male turkeys appropriately named gobblers actually make that sound. Female turkeys cackle instead. So if you're trying to figure out whether a turkey is male or female, just wait until they open their beaks and they let out a noise. Most Americans prefer Thanksgiving leftovers to the actual meal. So fans of the beloved turkey stuffing and mashed potato, I am one of those, that likes to eat it as a leftover sandwich, I don't do that. You're in the majority. Almost eight in 10 Americans agree that the second helpings of stuffing, mashed potatoes, and of course, pumpkin pie, beat out the big dinner itself. According to a 2015 Harris poll, sweet potato pie, as well as leftover stuffing recipes and easy mashed potato recipes are super popular. People will craft creative leftover concoctions out of what doesn't get consumed during the feast or just head back for a whole second act. If you find yourself raiding the fridge, you're in good company. Uh, I would be one of those that likes that. Next fun fact, the Butterball Turkey Talk Line answers almost 100,000 calls each season. So many people roast a big turkey just once a year and understandably need a little help there's no question that is too silly for the heroes on the other end of this line. In 2016, the company's popular cooking crisis management team also introduced a 24-hour text message line or the Butterball Turkey Talk line 
for the lead up into the big day. So if you're wondering why the turkey isn't turning out quite the way you want it or why your oven starts on fire like Taylor's firefighter father-in-laws did one year, don't panic. Help is just a call away. So don't panic. You can even text message. Okay, this one's for Becca. She's the associate producer. Canada also celebrates Thanksgiving, but on a different day. Our neighbors to the north also celebrate Thanksgiving, but they do so on a different day and for an unrelated reason. While American Thanksgiving pays homage to a feast between the pilgrims and the Native Americans, the Canadian celebration commemorates a feast between English explorer Martin Frobisher and his crew after their successful sail from England to the Canadian territory in 1578. Canadian Thanksgiving takes place on the second Monday of October every year. That doesn't mean there are just zero similarities between the two holidays. Both American and Canadian Thanksgiving menus often revolve around Thanksgiving, and revelers in both countries frequently spend the day watching football marathons and festive parades, just like us here in the United States. In Canada, the biggest one is the Kitchener-Waterloo Oktoberfest Thanksgiving Day Parade. Next fact, Americans eat an estimated 50 million pumpkin pies on Thanksgiving. Yum, whipped cream the whole way. Some of us consider pumpkin pie a vehicle for whipped cream topping and could take it or leave it. If you'd also rather leave your pumpkins for Halloween and dig into another Thanksgiving dessert, you're not alone. According to the American Pie Council, most Americans prefer apple pie overall even over pumpkin. It comes in, pumpkin comes in second place. I just love pie. So I think pie is very comforting. So we're gonna take a break to hear from our sponsor. Thank you to Cat5 Studios. The Intern Whisperer is brought to you by Cat5 Studios who help you create games and videos for your training and marketing needs that are out of this world. Visit Cat5 Studios for more information to learn how Cat5 Studios can help your business. Thank you, Cat5 Studios. Now, typically in the second half of the show, we look at what jobs and industries will look like in 2030. But for Thanksgiving, we're still going to stay pretty much in the present. According to writer Mike Brown, Americans will eat lab-grown Thanksgiving turkeys by 2030 instead of those that we're eating right now that are all raised on the land. Well, Thanksgiving is a time for togetherness and catching up with families, if researchers have their way, Eating turkey meat will be grown in bioreactors. You might be asking yourself, what the heck is a bioreactor? It refers to any manufactured device or a system that supports a biologically active environment. So they're growing them in test tubes, people. Scientists want to take lab-grown meat to the next level, developing new technologies that will grow tanks full of meat unlike today's expensive and uneconomical efforts that grow small amounts of meat in thin sheets. And so if you are thinking about all those chickens and turkeys and animals that are raised in tightly court, tight quarters and also in pens, that's gonna be going away because we would be having it grown in the lab and it's going to taste like the real thing. So interesting fun fact for the vegans, Tofurky roasts, that's T-O-F-U-R-K-Y, have existed since 1995. Those of us who rarely partake in turkey would have indulged in some tasty options at the very first Thanksgiving since the original guests sampled a seafood spread of oysters and delectable shellfish. There was also courtesy, well, those were courtesy of the Native Americans. These days, one main meatless alternative for the star bird is tofurkey. Get a taste of this plant-based meat from tofurkey for Thanksgiving with their vegan-friendly, non-GMO tofurkey roast. Vegetarians, vegans, and pescatarians should delight in this tantalizing food option. While I have not tried it, I am down for trying it and seeing if it tastes like the real thing. So go to your local supermarket 
go to your local supermarket and check it out and see if you agree that it tastes like real turkey or if you can tell the difference. I recently watched on Hulu a show called David Chang. He's a chef and, Mor uh, and Morgan Neville as they grapple with the future of food. It's called The Next Thing You Eat. They look at all types of what the future of food will look like from the different sources, sustainability. They look at how it's prepared, how COVID really impacted the, the restaurant business and what does the future of restaurants look like? It's really an amazing look at what we should be thinking about now. We get our food delivered, whether it's from a grocery store or even if it's from the restaurant that's our favorite place. People may not go to restaurants, maybe as much. So how do we handle all of that? Where will food be prepared? In home kitchens or somewhere else like commissary kitchens? We look at how food can be super popular from the foods that we're accustomed to eating, but moving to more of a plant-based food rather than meat. And then also looking at bugs as a source of proteins. We can see how food is gonna be prepared, processed and distributed. And I would really encourage everybody to check out this show on Hulu and see what the future of our food and how it's being prepared and sent to us is going to look like in 2030. So years from now, when people are in the grocery store trying to decide if they want to buy traditional versus cultivated meat, I'm 100% sure that cultured meat is going to be just as cheap, if not cheaper, said Paul Mudziski, a researcher at the North Carolina State University when he wrote in his report. Meat grown in a lab is not new, but right now it's prohibitively expensive. At the university, Mark Post grew and ate the world's first lab-grown burger in 2013. But the experiment cost over $300,000. Post teamed up with food technician Peter Verstraight to form Masa Meat, that's M-O-S-A, a company dedicated to pushing these costs down and getting lab-grown meat on store shelves by 2020. Other companies like Beyond Meat, and I have eaten that one, it tastes delicious, are pushing to refine the technology by adding in extra juices and flavor. So let's listen to some more people tell us what the meaning of Thanksgiving is to them. For me, it's uh, it reminds me of like just being with family and uh, people you love and getting together. But it's also like a time of questioning because if you look back in the history of Thanksgiving, it's not as pleasant as we all uh, see it to be as how it's sold to us. So I'm kind of back and forth with like what Thanksgiving really means because it comes from a cool place. Um, so that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> you know, just time to reconnect with family, have people over. Um, for Thanksgiving this year, I'm actually having some friends come visit. So um, overall, you know, just time to take it easy and connect with loved ones. Now, for myself, I am aware of the fact that life is better than what I deserve. I didn't grow up in the, obviously, the 16, 17, 1800s. So, like, this is a pretty good life. The world is surely filled with pain and suffering, hardship and turmoil, disappointment and regret. But we need to just slow down to remember all that God has done for us and to give thanks and show gratitude. So most have probably heard this quote, for unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required from Luke 12, 48. We as people of this planet that we inhabit have a responsibility that becomes a privilege and we don't even recognize it. We are blessed, we are gifted to give, we are blessed to bless others, and we are not lucky, fortunate, or merely disciplined. We are expected to do something with the grace that we've been given. And I am challenging everybody that listens to the show to just remember grace. Give grace to others and also remember to give grace to yourself. We have so much 
in our life. And we just need to remember to be grateful. So as a child, I didn't underestimate, well, I actually didn't understand, but let me start over. As a child, I didn't understand gratitude as much as I do now that I'm older. In a universe that seemed to hurt for no reason others, we give thanks. In a universe that seemed to hurt for no reason, giving thanks felt disingenuous. Living in a world where children die of hunger every day, where people live and die on the street because of COVID, because of homelessness, because of disease, because of violence, it just doesn't make sense. But now I understand that being grateful is a choice. So this is my list of what gratitude is. And before I go to my list, gratitude is not just, gratitude is not a human's nature. No, starting over, all over. So take out, this is my list, all the way to where I am starting over now. Gratitude is not a human natural emotion to, to take on. It takes time and effort to slow down and recognize all we have in life. I have to take time to think about what I am grateful for and recognize it. So one of my favorite things to do when walking is to just use that as a gratitude walk and to remember all that I have and to give thanks for those things. So here's my challenge to all of you as listeners. Take time today and every day, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, to come up with a gratitude list. If it doesn't come naturally, don't let that stop you from still giving thanks. There is so much to be thankful for if we only take time to just sit down and reflect. So here are my 10 reasons to give thanks. I'm thankful for my health for being able to participate in extreme races and jump over fire to set a goal. And I just love doing those extreme races. I would tell my mom, my dad, my brother about it. And they would go, you know, you can join the military and do this for nothing. <laughs> you don't even have to do that. My mother thought it was ridiculous to want to jump into a, a, a pool of mud and swim through it. But I really enjoyed that. And I just celebrated and I just was thankful that I could walk, that I could actually just feel all of those emotions and, and everything that came with it and jumping over fire. It's not like giant rings of fire, but it was fire and it meant something and it was significant. So the next goal, more of those extreme races, but now taking on a half marathon and always remembering to eat turkey dinner. And I'm just saying, Wawa has a great Thanksgiving dinner in a pinch. So if you like that gobbler bowl, go grab one. The second thing I'm thankful for is my family. My dad, my mom, and my ridiculous brothers. We shared ups and downs and managed to work through all of the issues that come with being a family. To all those I am privileged to work with and be part of my crazy startup story, I consider you family. And to all my friends, those that are passing through my life that have been here for a reason, a season, and hopefully for life, I am thankful and count you as part of my family. My cousins, my nieces, all of us together. We are passing through periods of life and we don't always recognize that these people are here for a reason. They're either there to help us get through something or we are there to help them get through something. And if we are filled with gratitude, not just blessed and lucky, there are a few that will stay with us for a lifetime. I am thankful, the third thing is, I am thankful for the gift and opportunity to build and stand up not one company, but six. This is not for the faint of heart. I asked God for an effing empire and he gave it to me. And I should have asked him, well, what is this gonna cost me? Since I did not, now I tell myself and remind myself, well, now I tell myself God has blessed me with this so I need to keep trusting God. 
Startup life is really hard. And at times it's really easy. It's easy to do, it's hard to master. It's always frustrating, it's always rewarding. There is just no flipping way I could have done this by myself. So I am thankful for each person, the past, the present, and the future, who have been a part of this journey of growing Employers for Change, the E4C Academy, this podcast, our game on Steam, Cat5 Studios. Thank you to each and every one of you. I'm going to tag you on the social channels. Number four, I am extremely thankful for the startup community of entrepreneurs, founders, and mentors who are making a difference in the world. You all inspire me. Number five, I am thankful for being surrounded by creative minds, people with influence and power that have lifted me up and given me opportunities to stay afloat, to grow, and to thrive. Number six, I am thankful for doing work that matters, that brings awareness to what diversity and inclusion means and looks like in this world. It is not just faces on a page. It is not the color of our skin. It is not even the gender or your age. It is so much more than that. I am thankful for the ability to help others see how we are all a hot mess, and yet we are amazing superheroes at the same time. And it's really the fact that we can actually all learn from each other. That is the thing we need to remember. We're made for relationships and we need one another. Number seven, I am thankful for music. Musical artists and bands, some of my three favorite songs are Bless the Broken Road by Rascal Flatts, What a Wonderful World by Louis Armstrong, and Happy by Beryl Beryl Williams. I don't think I'm saying his first name right either. Anyway, you know, it's from Minions. Their words and music have inspired me. They make me smile and they remember that everything is okay. I am thankful for movies and for being able to turn off my brain and just still have fun to be inspired to laugh. So you guys know I talk about Men in Black and Guardians of the Galaxy. And yes, aliens do live here on Earth. Those are my two of my favorite movies. And my third is The Princess Bride. Just remember to to love. I'm thankful for books. This is my number nine. I am thankful for books, ebooks, audiobooks, children's books, podcasts, the count, and memoirs. I love to hold books, to turn the pages, to write in the margins and revisit them over and over. Oh, and I guess I should also add a few other books over here. The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien, Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. And yes, I know there's controversy over this book, but to me, I still think it's a reminder to go and look at to not be selfish and not self-absorbing and to recognize that we can also be looking to the future and remember we're here to give, we're here to serve others. The Bible and the Power of Servant Leadership by Robert Greenleaf. And my number 10, lastly, and most importantly, is I'm thankful for grace, this awesome gift from God for love that cannot be explained, only surrendered to, for a creator that inspires me, inspires creativity, curiosity, hope, and for purpose that there's more to the story that we see of each other. So what is the best mentoring advice that I want to share with our listeners? We are made for relationship from each other. Remember those that invested in you and to pay it forward, to show kindness and caring for everyone, even those that are difficult. And at times, remember, we also are difficult. So how can our listeners contact us? Well, you can go to our website, e4c.tech, T-E-C-H. You can go and read our blog articles. Check out our social channels, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, our YouTube. Hey, we're trying to hit over 100 subscribers on YouTube and over 100 subscribers on Podbean. So please go and subscribe to our show on those two channels. Help us hit that milestone for us. You can look for me on LinkedIn, Isabella Johnston, and be sure to connect with me, but also connect with our people. 
Look at our company and connect with them. These are amazing people. They've been in the past and the present and those that are coming in the future. I am so lucky. Nope. I am highly favored and greatly blessed and thankful to work with such amazing people. This particular set of interns that have been working with me, Alex Teal, Becca Coffey, and also Nick Morales, thank you. You guys have done such a great job on this podcast, making everything look smooth and seamless. So I want to thank you for just everything that you have done. Thank you to our sponsor, Cat5 Studios. Thank you to our production team, Becca Coffey, associate producer intern, video and audio editing team, Steve Meese, Ayana Sanders, and our video interns, Nick Morales and Alex Teal. Music by Dave Francis, Sophie Lloyd, Charles Fleming, and Elijah Sutton. And sound effects by Matt Miller, Miguel Centra, and Dave Francis. Be sure to visit us at Employers for Change, E4, the number four, C.tech, to learn how you can create real diversity and inclusion culture through your recruiting and your skilling of the people for your future of work. Thank you for supporting The Interim Whisper by subscribing to our show on Podbean, YouTube, or your favorite podcast channel.